You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is February 1st, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, NHLBI 2020 Focused Updates to the Asthma Management Guidelines. Our presenter is Dr. Alan Baptist. He's an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Michigan School of Medicine in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, good morning, everyone. This is the second hour of COLA for February 1st, uh, 2021. Um, the year is going quickly. Um, <clears throat> are you ready, Alan? I Yes, I am all set. Do you want to put your introductory slide on or your title slide? Um, I Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I can. And while I, uh, yeah, and I'll talk about something in a minute okay yeah we can start with actually oh actually i'll put this slide there we go okay okay um <clears throat> good morning um we have the pleasure of having dr alan baptist um who's an associate professor of medicine at the university of michigan um, um he's also the director of the um <clears throat> university of michigan comprehensive asthma management program Dr. Baptist um, has been part of the um, group that was doing the focused updates for the NHLBI um, 2020 asthma update. Um, uh, poor Alan has um, her, had me bothering him for the last year um, trying to get him to speak, but they kept delaying the uh, release of the um, guidelines. Um, and so finally we cornered him so he didn't have any other excuses anymore. <laughs> so, so I appreciate him taking the time from his busy schedule to speak to us today about the uh, focused updates for the asthma management guidelines. Alan, I'll let you take it away. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Paul. And, and I'm glad that I am finally able to speak on the guidelines. Um, so if I, I know we have a number of fellows who are online, and I'm not sure if people are listening uh, as well, but anyone is welcome to play. So if, if all the fellows who are online don't mind, if you can on your mobile device is best, if you can go on your mobile device, download uh, Kahoot from the App Store, it'll, whether it's your Android or iPhone, uh, and think of a fun nickname. You, you, that way you can stay anonymous. Uh, it won't be, uh, you know, preserved for eternity on uh, the Cola uh, series for whoever won, if you will. Uh, and then there's, if you download Kahoot, there's a little um, button right at the bottom that should say play or enter pin or something along those lines. Uh, the pin is there, uh, 3315465. Um, so hopefully that works. Is any, and, and let me know if anyone's having trouble, and maybe we, I can try to troubleshoot a little bit of it before we start. Okay, and I am just going to, okay, so this is, we, we've got a couple people coming in so far, two of the, People are in, as you can see here, Wheeze and Sneeze and Flovent have, uh, have joined, and hopefully the other fellows are able to, too, because it is definitely better if there's more than just two people playing. Okay. And, Paula, will there only be about three fellows, is that right? Um, we actually have five fellows. Okay. Um, there we go. We're all here today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it looks like four have joined so far. And uh, yeah. Yeah. hi, Alan. Jay Portnoy here too. I'm not a fellow, but I'm still logged in. Absolutely, Jay. <laughs> I definitely want. I won't ask you which one you are on there for sure. But feel free, uh, fellows and faculty. Anyone faculty who's there or, or anything like that, uh, feel free. Okay, <laughs> we got, I think that's a good number, so we got five, and I do believe you can, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think you can join as we go. So if you've used Kahoot, hopefully it's on your mobile device, and it'll go a little bit better um, that way. So, sorry, so let me go back now, and we'll get back to here. Okay, so... These are our, what we're going to do today is talk about uh, the guidelines that just came out in December. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest, uh, some research and some consultant support. Now, actually, 
these are all companies that deal with asthma as well. And it's important to know in the guidelines, what would happen is we had to travel to the NIH back when travel was possible uh, multiple times. And the NIH actually had um, reviewers of all conflicts of interest. And for all the members of the committee, if you had a conflict that uh, for any of the discussions, you were actually recused. You actually had to leave the room, couldn't vote, any of those type of things. So, and in the guidelines, they actually, when it was finally printed, they published who had conflicts for certain parts. So our learning objectives are to understand the process in developing the new asthma management guidelines, to learn how to apply changes in asthma diagnosis monitoring treatment based on evidence and shared decision making, and to determine the strengths and the limitations of the asthma guidelines, and really to talk about you know, why these might be different from other guidelines like GINA that you see or things like that, and explain a little bit of why it took so long to come out. This talk shouldn't take the whole hour, so I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. Okay, let's go back to look at the timeline for this. So as uh, some of you may know, the previous EPR3 guidelines, the asthma guidelines, were released in 2007, okay? And in 2014, I hope you can see my pointer here, but in 2014, there was a decision that we needed to update the guidelines. Now, here's the problem. The, the decision was made in 2014 that the guidelines need to be updated, and by 2015, the topics were chosen. There's a long way between 2015 and 2021, right? And, you know, it, it, you, it, that has its problems in some ways. Um, the, 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 some of the questions that were relevant in 2015 are not really that relevant now, per se. And, and some of the ones, probably more importantly, some of the topics that became more relevant more recently, specifically biologics, which people will often ask about, were not a big thing back in 2014 and 2015. There was only one biologic out at the time, omeluzumab, right? And so in some ways, there, that is a, a little bit of a problem, if you will, with the guidelines. This is the members of the guideline committee. And you can see here, it's a mix of allergists, pulmonologists, primary care docs, gen med researchers, there's health policy experts, there's pharmacists, a, a number of things. And again, if anyone had a conflict of interest, they were recused. And you can see there are names that you've probably seen uh, in your readings and, and who have done a lot for um, asthma from the Quad A, from allergy. Uh, Bob Lomansky is on there. Uh, of course, uh, Michael Schatz is on there, and, and a number of people who you probably, names you might recognize, are on here. So, what was, the, the, the first point is this was a focused update, okay? It's not a complete revision, uh, and, and I'll go through kind of how it was done. The, the intent is to inform, improve asthma management and support informed shared decision making, and this actually becomes really important as we go forward because it's going to drive how the recommendations are presented. Now, what is shared decision making? This, so in the traditional model, right, you're the doctor, you say, look, here's what you gotta do, I know why your asthma is under control, take this inhaler, take this uh, oral medication, you will do better, okay? That's the classic way, the kind of paternalistic way that medicine has been practiced for a long time, and we've realized that doesn't really work very well. What's far more important is shared decision-making. And shared decision-making means that you have to look at what the patient's values are, what the patient's preferences are, when you are deciding what makes the most sense. And, and we'll talk about how this becomes important in how the guidelines are presented. Now, there are, there's, guide, there's guidance in six areas. These are the six areas that were chosen in 2014 and 2015 as key areas of uh, asthma diagnosis, management, and treatment. Um, and this was selected through a comprehensive literature review, consultation with the experts, and soliciting comments from the public. So they, that's how these areas were uh, selected back at the time. And, and 19 recommendations uh, in the six areas uh, were made. Okay. So the, the, the guidelines were, were created with something called grade methodology, okay? And, and what is grade methodology? Well, it's a framework to determine the quality of the evidence, so how good is the evidence, and the direction and strength. How strong are we that we feel certain about this evidence? But just as importantly, okay, that, that the, 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 with grade, you choose your outcomes of interest, and then we assess each paper to determine if it addressed and improved these critical and important outcomes. So before we started, 
the committee, well, you know, before we started looking at the uh, literature for anything, we said, what are our critical outcomes in, in asthma? And those were determined to be exacerbations, asthma control, and asthma-related quality of life. And then we looked at important outcomes, things like symptoms, rescue medication use, and others that may vary a little bit with topic. And we tried to use validated measures with a, a, a minimally important difference whenever these are important. However, here's the thing with GRADE, okay? It's, it's let me go to the next slide. It's, there's two main components, okay? First, you have to look at the evidence profile. And that's based on, we look to see the strength of evidence there. So you look if the direction is consistent. You look for risk of bias. You look for effect size. You look for things like publication bias or how large the confidence interval is. All of those type of things first, okay? But this is important. You know, when, when I teach, I teach the fellows how to read a um, article, how to analyze an um, uh, article to make uh, decisions for the patient in front of you. And I always say you need two things. You have to know how to read the journal article, right? You have to understand how, uh, how a study is set up, what a p-value means, those type of things. But evidence alone is never enough. You have to have content expertise, and that's really important. That's why, you know, I can, I, I, you know, I have a master's in public health, and I've done a lot of courses, and I can read journal articles fairly well, I like to think. But if you gave me a cardiology, electrophysiology article and asked me to critically analyze it, I can't really do it justice because I don't have that content expertise to know if those are important outcomes, if that is what is important to a patient, those type of things. So you need that. And that is really part of the reason that the, the EPR panel was selected. There was, if you notice, and I forgot to mention on that slide, that first slide that showed the timeline, I forgot, in 2015, the choices, the topics were picked. From 2016 through about 2018, AHRQ, or ARC, right, uh, Agency for Health Research and Quality, they spent two years having policy experts and, and data scientists read through all the evidence selected for those topics, okay? And then they presented it to us in 2018. That's when I kind of got involved in 2018 through 2021 that they asked us, one, are there any newer articles that need to be included? But two, have we chosen all the right outcomes? Does this make sense to a patient? Okay. Um, and, and so that's part of it. And so then what happened is when we joined, we took the evidence and we made what's called evidence to decision tables. So then we took into account things like shared decision making, which I'm going to talk to and that sort of thing. And the, 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 the thing about the guidelines that we produced, they all had to be strongly evidence-based, okay? So everything that we gave a recommendation for was supported by evidence. We did not, even though we, some of us may say, and I'm going to bring this up as we go forward, some of us would say, you know, clinically, this makes sense. I, I would probably do this clinically. If there wasn't data that supported it. If there wasn't evidence that showed that it was effective, we would not include it as a recommendation. All right? And that is very different than something like GINA, for example. And you can make arguments that there are pluses and minuses to either approach. I, I do use the GINA guidelines for certain things. I think that you know they have a nice um, uh, figure of how to choose a certain biologic for a certain patient, but it's not evidence-based. Right? There are no head-to-head -head trials, per se, of different biologics. I'm just giving an example here. So if something like that, we would not have given recommendations in the 2020 asthma guideline update, if that makes sense. For each recommendation, there were four options. You could vote for or against, okay, and strong or conditional. Now, the for or against, you know, is again, we're looking at the data. So we're looking at how strong the data is. The recommendation, this is where that shared decision making gets really important. A strong recommendation is, look, the data is so overwhelming and you don't really need a lot of shared decision making. Most people would want it, only a small proportion wouldn't, okay? For, for, for clinicians, you know, the patient, most patients, you should do it. You don't really need a decision aid to do shared decision making. You can see conditional recommendation is, look, okay, the evidence points that way, but there are other extenuating circumstances. This is really, you need to consider every patient's values and preferences much more carefully. And, and for patients, yeah, the data points that way. Most patients will learn it, but many might not. 
and, and for the clinician, decision aids might be helpful. And just so you know, we have 19 recommendations. Only three of them are strong recommendations. For the other 16, you need to do shared decision making, even if the evidence is strong. That's we'll get to, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. So that is a little bit of an intro and, and of how the guidelines were made and what their pluses and what their minuses are, if you will. Now let's get into the guidelines. All right. So these are the six topic areas that were chosen. I'm not going to read them because we're going to go in depth with each of these. But for these uh, guidelines, 20,500 references were initially considered. OK, they were screened. This is what ARC did initially. Then they selected 450, which included that went until 2018. OK, uh, and reviewed all of those 450. And then when the expert panel got together, we added another additional 15 that were done in the, in the following year and a half, okay? And, and that's how those, that, that data was put together. Um, others were considered, uh, but not included to that due to lack of sufficient data, things like that, all right? So let's get to intermittent corticosteroid. So the first question I'm going to ask you guys, and we're going to switch to Kahoot in a second here. So let's say you have a young child. All right, let's say you got a three-year-old kid and they're having occasional wheezing and let's just call, you know, two to three times a year, not, not all the time, two to three times a year, they wheeze. And you give, and, and they've been prescribed albuterol. Hopefully they got a better nebulizer as uh, this one's not really going to cut it for this kid, but that's another story. Um, and, and so they got, you know, you're giving them albuterol two to three times a year. The question is, should you give this kid intermittent um, corticosteroids? So... Okay, we are going to start the game here. All right, so the first question is going to come up, and this one's just got a little bit more time. I just wanted to make sure everyone can get it. So uh, hold on on your phone in a second. It's going to tell you, in a young child who presents with intermittent asthma, with intermittent wheezing, occasional wheezing, this kid does not have asthma, should you add uh, intermittent inhaled corticosteroids? So if you could on your phone, if you don't mind answering yes or no, it should be the red or the... Uh, blue button. Okay, so most of you chose yes, and that is the correct answer. Good. All right, and it, it also depends on how quickly you answer your question, how you get the score. So that's very good. This was, and what the, 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 the guidelines found is for children ages 0 to 4 with recurrent wheezing triggered by respiratory infections only, and no wheezing in between, episodes, in between infections, the expert panel does recommend a short course of inhaled steroids at the onset of respiratory tract infection, uh, and, and of course with albuterol as well. And this was, the, the evidence was very good here, high certainty of evidence. It helped to keep the kids off oral corticosteroids by, it was a 33% reduction. OK, so you could say, why is it a conditional recommendation? The reason is this treatment could affect growth. And there was conflicting data on this. OK, and, and so because of that, careful monitoring is needed and it's a conditional recommendation and something you could you should discuss. And of course, you can make the argument that oral corticosteroids will affect growth more. That hasn't been studied quite as carefully in a head to head manner in some ways. And, and the, the entry into these studies was actually only three or more infections in a lifetime, or two or more in the past year. And, and what they usually did was inhale corticosteroids for about seven to 10 days. This can be done at home. You can give them an asthma action plan. So that seems to work, all right? Okay, now let's go on. So the, question two had two parts uh, for intermittent steroids. In patients with persistent asthma, does increasing the ICS dose during an asthma worsening help? So this is, we're talking about quadru even quadrupling or quintupling, okay? So we're going to go to Kahoot here. And, okay, so this is a true-false question. In a patient with persistent asthma, increasing the ICS dose during an asthma exacerbation is a good idea. This will give benefit, all right? So go ahead and answer. Okay, and the correct answer in this case is actually false. It does not seem to help. All right, and let me jump back here. So what that was found from the data for children ages four and older and adults with mild to moderate persistent asthma who are likely to be adherent to daily ICS, 
they, the expert panel conditionally recommends against a short-term increase in ICS dose for increased symptoms or decreased uh, peak flow. Now, there wasn't great evidence, and this is a conditional recommendation. And this, there were three studies, and this was looking at doubling, quadrupling, or quintupling the dose. It did not seem to help. However, in 2018, there was one study in the New England Journal that did find that quadrupling uh, it, it helped in patients who were non-adherent. When they looked at everyone, it didn't help that much, but if you're, if you're more non-adherent, those patients have helped. And the adherence rate was about 40 to 50% in that study. Now, you can make an argument that's probably realistic uh, in real life what patients are, are adherent, if not lower than that. But that's the patients who it seems to help. And so if you have patients who are, you know, very, no, no, doc, I always take it. And, and you truly believe them and you, you know, you have any data or you, you have a good relationship and, and they really seem to be an adherent patient, increasing your ICS dose will not help. All right. Non-adherent patients, different story. Okay. And we're going to jump to Kahoot again here. Okay. So now. 25-year-old patient is using albuterol three to four times a week, wakes up once a week, uh, and their FEV1 is normal. What would you do? Medium dose ICS plus promoterol daily and as needed, LTRA daily, albuterol and ICS only as needed, or a daily medium dose ICS, okay? So now we've moved, we're moving into this mild persistent type asthmatic patient. You can go ahead and answer. Uh, what would you, how would you treat this patient? Okay, and so this is getting a little trickier here. So the correct answer for this, and this is a, a fairly large paradigm shift in the mild persistent asthma category, uh, goes to albuterol and an ICS as needed. Very different than what we've done previously, at least what I've done previously. So what was found in individuals age 12, over 12, okay, so this doesn't work in the young kids, okay, or in kids, it's uh, adolescents and adults. Two of the following treatments are recommended, either a low-dose ICS, so not a medium dose, but a low-dose ICS, and as-needed albuterol for, for quick relief therapy, or intermittent as-needed ICS and albuterol used one after the other for a worsening uh, asthma recommendation. You don't have to use a daily controller in mild persistent asthma. That was one of the specific questions. Okay, um, It's moderate certainty of evidence. Okay. Um, there were three fairly large trials. They were not always powered as equivalency trials, so that limits it a little bit, and, and that's what the data scientists also said. Okay, there's not enough data under the age of 12, and in fact, in one study, it actually found that regular had less exacerbation. So if you were answering for kids, that seemed to be better. However, that study also showed growth retardation in kids. Okay, there, by the way, if you get to a moderate dose, you are going to have growth retardation there's fairly good, and I guarantee you at, at a high dose, okay, something to keep in mind. Now, will you get catch-up growth? That's a different question. Will you get adrenal suppression? That is also a different question, but very prevalent at higher doses, depending on how sensitive your test is. Um, and, and how do you decide between the two? Well, if someone's a poor perceiver, then you might want to use a daily dose, but, but um, right now, and how long do you give someone an albuterol? Here's what they did in the studies, and this is what I've started doing myself. I tell someone who has mild persistent asthma, which is going to be the majority of your asthmatics, okay, look, use albuterol first, all right? If, if it goes on more than a day, you need albuterol more than a day, then you add on an ICS for 7 to 10 days, all right? So, and, and continue to use albuterol during that time. Too. Right now, it's two inhalers. In the future, it might be one. There are companies looking at that, okay? So, again, this is a fairly large change from what we've been doing for the mild persistent asthmatics, which we've always said, oh, you got to use something every day, got to use something every day. That's a large change. Okay, next question, okay? Now, you, now let's move, we're moving from the mild to the moderate and severe persistent asthma patients. I, can I use an ICS LABA as their only inhaler? So the old way we used to do things was you have a, a steroid and a, a LABA, ICS and LABA, and then when you have problems, you give them albuterol or a, a, a SABA, right? Something called smart therapy means that you have your ICS plus LABA, but the LABA has to be famotorol, okay? Only famotorol works, and we can talk about why only famotorol. Uh, and you use it as both your daily medicine and for your relief. 
your, your um, uh, reliever therapy. You only need one inhaler from now on. We don't need an albuterol any longer. And, and what do the guidelines say? I'm not going to read all of this because they kind of come to the same thing. For individuals who are older with moderate to severe asthma, the preferred therapy is a single-dose ICS plus fumarole as both daily and as needed. This is a strong recommendation, high certainty of evidence. Okay, and for individuals 12 or older with moderate to per, per severe persistent asthma, preferred there is a single inhaler. Both uh, uh, the bottom line: use an ICS plus promoter as your controller and reliever for your moderate to severe persistent asthmatic patients. That's the bottom line. Okay, uh, and this is getting past the age of 4 to 12. Now, is this FDA approved? No. Uh, will insurance companies give you a hard time? Possibly. The, guide, the, the goal of this guideline committee is actually to drive the FDA and to drive the insurance companies to do what the evidence supports. And so we are hopeful that as this goes forward, these uh, different regulation bodies and things like that will follow the guidelines of the NIH uh, in, in to do it. But the bottom line is you should be using, for your moderate to severe persistent asthmatics, you can use an ICS plus Fomoterol, and only Fomoterol works because of the, the issues of how quick it works and its onset of action and its, its, um, uh, its, uh, you know, its pharmacokinetic properties. Okay. Llamas. Yeah, big question. Three questions came up for the llamas. Okay. So now we've got moderate persistent asthmatics. Okay. And they're not controlled. What do we want to do? So the first question is, you're on an ICS alone. Is llama as good as adding a lava? Are these equivalent or not? Next, you have an ICS alone. What's a good step-up option? Okay, should I increase the ICS? Should I add Montelukast? Well, you know, if it's not a LABA, what, what, what else should it be? Third, patients on an ICS and LABA already with a LAMA help, triple therapy, if you will. Okay, now, importantly, this is, this is only, by the way, in ages above 12, because at the time, teotropium, you know, was only approved above the age of 12. First question, so if asthma is not controlled by an ICS therapy alone, adding a LABA rather than a LAMA is recommended. ICS plus LABA is greater than ICS LAMA. And this is in our step three therapy, which we'll get to when I show diagrams later on. Now, this was a very contentious uh, time, I will tell you, on the committee. The reason is most outcomes were actually very similar. This includes asthma exacerbations. This includes asthma quality. This includes asthma quality of life. This includes control, rescue medication use, mortality. And this was in five randomized control trials with about 2,600 subjects. It's pretty good evidence. However, there was one real-world study of 500 subjects, so fairly large, and it was only in black adults. Okay, it was, uh, it was called a different study, but it was only limited to African-American or black adults. And what they found is that adding an ICS, uh, sorry, adding a LAMA to an ICS caused more hospitalizations than when a LABA was added. Okay, and, and so because of this study, really, it drives the recommendations. There wasn't quite as many real-world studies for the others, and, and there was arguments of which is better, a kind of a more pragmatic real-world design, uh, or the more strict randomized control trials. And uh, this was, again, only in black individuals. But because of that study, the committee decided that it is better to add a LABA than a LAMA. And again, you, you can argue both ways. All right. That was the first question. Oh, I'm sorry. Second question. If a LABA cannot be used, you can't tolerate it. There's a contraindication. Adding a LAMA to an ICS is an acceptable alternative, meaning ICS plus LAMA is better than ICS plus nothing. OK, I suppose that would definitely be true. Now, the initial question was, is it better to add a LAMA then increase the dose of ICS or to add Montelukast. Which of those would be better? The data was so poor that no conclusions could be made. And again, I told you this, this committee was extremely evidence-based. And so we did not make recommendations if we did not have evidence. There are only two studies that kind of looked at this and neither addressed any of the critical outcomes and therefore we did not include them. Um, again, be careful if someone's got urinary retention or glaucoma or things like that. Okay, now the triple therapy question. We're going to jump back to Kahoot here. Oops, sorry. Okay, so a patient is on an ICS and LABA. Adding a LAMA will improve what? Asthma exacerbations requiring an OCS, asthma quality of life, 
rescue albuterol use or none of the above. Does adding triple therapy do anything? And if it does something, which does it do? Okay, and the correct answer is actually asthma quality of life. All right, and so this is actually, let me switch back here. So what was found? If asthma is not controlled with an ICS in LABA, adding a LAMA is recommended for many people because it offers a small potential benefit. Guess what? There were three studies, about 1,300 individuals. Adding a LAMA to an ICS, it, it may improve your asthma control and your quality of life. It did not help exacerbations. It's not going to keep your, your patient off oral steroids or out of the hospital. So don't go into it thinking it's going to do that. It's not going to really affect their, their rescue medication use and not really going to affect their um, spirometry type results and things like that. It's something to keep in mind. It really seems to help control and quality of life. All right. But it is a recommendation that it's probably a good idea to add. And by the way, this was not looked at the real severe patients. The data, the, the trials that were done were not looking at patients, for example, who would be on a biological, who would even qualify necessarily. And that will become important when we look at the step diagrams. Okay, how about allergen, indoor allergen mitigation? All right, so the question was, a couple of questions came up. Does control of the indoor environment help in asthma? Okay, and, and if it does help, what is the way to do it? And should we be doing it for everyone? Remember, there was th th there's very little harms, if you will, from a dust mite cover, and there were trials of we're going to give everyone who's got allergies a dust mite cover, right? There were big trials in the New England Journal about this, 700-person trials of either dust mite cover or nothing. And again, these are some of the different things that they were looking at, so, uh, you know, dust mites and cockroaches and mold and mice and dogs and pet dander and things like that. So what's, what was found? So there were four recommendations, and I'm just going to go through them briefly here. So what they found is one, in, in oh, and by the way, the data was lousy, okay? In general, this was some of the worst data that we had to analyze. Uh, most of the trials were older. Most of them didn't use standardized outcomes. Uh, and so we did the best with the ones that we could, and some of them had to be thrown out because they, they were so poor. Um, but what the, and, and there are many studies, okay, that, that we had to analyze. So what they found is, first, individuals with no history of exposure and no allergies or symptoms. And we really were like, do you have to have history? Sorry, do you have to have uh, symptoms, okay? Do you have to have exposure? And do you have to have uh, evidence of an IgE or sensitization? And we tried to put those together and see, which, do you need all three? Do you need one of them? But this is how the wording came out. Basically, if you don't have exposure and you don't have uh, symptoms or uh, sensitization, either or, then don't do uh, prophylactic allergen avoidance for everyone. You need to do it targeted as much as possible. And that's what the second point is. The second point is, if you're going to do allergen mitigation strategies, you need to do multiple strategies. Using one strategy often does not improve asthma outcomes. All right. And again, from the EPR3, we didn't change this. All individuals with asthma of all severities should undergo an environmental assessment for exposure to allergens. OK. And that includes either history or, you know, skin testing or things like that. One of the things that we came out to recommend against for individuals with asthma who are sensitive to dust mites, impermeable dust mite covers are recommended only as part of a multi-component intervention. If you just go in and give some, and you found someone has dust mite covers, you just, it, dust mite allergy, and you give them dust mite covers, but they also have different allergens that they may be exposed to, the dust mite covers are not going to do anything. So you have to do, uh, you know, and that's point two, you need to do multiple strategies. And the one thing that actually did seem to help was integrated pest management. Now, it's not really a standalone, but, you know, this is if you have cockroaches or pests in the house, um, you, you know, rodents, et cetera. That was the one thing that seemed to work well alone, if you will. But, of course, it's an integrated pest management, so there's different parts of it. It did decrease exacerbations, in fact. And so that is the reason that, you know, these are four of the 19 bullet points uh, for the 19 recommendations were about these indoor allergen mitigation and, and integrated pest management works. And in the table, and I'm not going to go through this, they talk about what you can do if you're exposed to these different um, uh, 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 targeted allergens, what, what, what different types of targeted therapies that you can use. And again, you don't have to do all, for example, for animal dander, but these are things that seem to work. Next. Should I use subcutaneous immunotherapy for asthma? 
What about sublingual immunotherapy? All right, so what did we find? Subcutaneous therapy is recommended as an adjunct therapy for standard pharmacotherapy for individuals with mild to moderate asthma, not severe asthma, but mild to moderate, who demonstrate allergic sensitization and evidence of worsening asthma after exposure. There was moderate evidence and a conditional recommendation, and I'll tell you why. So these were, again, allergy shots to pets, outdoor allergens. As we all know, this has to be done in a physician's office, which has implications related to access and equity, right? The harms were variable. They're extremely variable. Up to 12% in some studies of subjects had a systemic reaction. All right. And this is very much about shared decision making. Uh, I think as we, as all of us know, it's a big commitment, right, for a patient. Individuals who place kind of a high value on improvements in quality of life and control and decreased meds and a, a low value on a risk of systemic re systematic reactions may be a good candidate. Okay, it didn't really seem to help exacerbations. That's important. That's why it's more for the mild to moderate. There was one small study in children that seemed to help exacerbations, but most of the others did not. Okay, so and there were there were a lot of studies. Forty four studies were included here. Many were older, however, and they didn't use validated outcomes and things like that. But it seems to work. Ah, okay. Now, how about slit therapy? All right. So let's let's jump over here. Okay, this is a true-false question. In patients with mild asthma, the evidence supports slit with house dust mite, specifically house dust mite. So you have a mild patient with asthma and house dust mite. Does the evidence support slit therapy? Okay, and the, and the three of you got that one right. The evidence, I'm sorry, let's do that one here. As Flovent jumps into the lead over there. Okay, and so the evidence review did not support the use of sublingual immunotherapy to specifically treat allergic asthma, okay? And, and so SLIT now, SLIT does seem to work for allergic rhinitis. And if someone has allergic rhinitis and allergic asthma, they may get a very small benefit, okay, uh, which is why it's conditional. The outcomes here, by the way, they were more standardized than the, the subcutaneous immunotherapy, but the improvements were really trivial, if at all, in most of the studies. All right. And there's all sorts of different ways that was done in some of these studies. There's drops, there's tablets. Only tablets are FDA approved in the U.S. Okay. Local reactions were fairly common. Up to 80% had local reactions. That being said, there was a high rate of local reactions of the placebo as well. And there were about 1,700 subjects that were evaluated. So, so slit therapy, the, the panel did not support its use. How about pheno? Okay. Can pheno help to diagnose asthma? Will it predict wheezing toddlers who will develop asthma? Should it be routinely used in choosing medications or responses? Okay, remember, at its core, asthma is airway inflammation. All right, that's really, I mean, it's, it's not bronchoconstriction and it's not airway hyperreactivity. Yes, those occur, but those occur because of the airway inflammation. Well, pheno is a non-invasive way to measure eosinophilic inflammation. This seems like a great test, right? Uh, now it does, of course, take some coaching, and it does require special uh, equipment, so there are questions of equity. But, all right, let's, we have one last Kahoot question, I believe. All right, and it's a true-false question. You have a patient and are unclear if asthma is present. You've done a spiral, you've done a history, a physical exam. Pheno can help make the diagnosis. Does pheno have a role in making a diagnosis of asthma, true or false? And the correct answer is true, that is right. <clears throat> Let me go back here. So what are, the, what are the recommendations regarding the pheno? There were three of them. Pheno, pheno may support a diagnosis of asthma in those greater than five in whom the diagnosis is uncertain, even after a complete history, physical, and spirometry testing, including bronchodilator responsiveness, okay? It's an additional resource if you are unclear. If you've done all these other things and you still don't know if someone's got asthma, it's reasonable to do a pheno test. It's an adjunct test, not to be used alone, okay? Second point, pheno may be used as part of an ongoing asthma monitoring and management strategy when there's uncertainty in adjusting therapy using clinical and laboratory assessment. You know, in, in, it's for management, it's, if, if you're not, it's not to be used alone, and it's not a one-time test. And most of the times that it should be used, it was found to be uh, helpful when it was checked every two to three months, which is not always practical. A one-time test didn't seem to help as much. 
all right? And, and, and it shouldn't be used in isolation. There were studies, right? There was a, you, know, you guys may have heard of the study, there was a New England Journal study where they said, you know what we're going to do? What we're going to do is we're going to give everyone with, um, uh, um, uh, we're going to either manage people with the pheno alone, or we're going to use all the standard step therapies, right? And, you know, if you see how often you're using albuterol and all those things, or we're just going to see how your pheno is doing. And what, so when we put all that data together, don't use it alone. It's not the only thing to use. And it is really an adjunct therapy. When you don't know, when you have questions, that's when you do it. You should not be doing it on all patients, basically. It, the data also didn't support it as an adherence monitor, okay? Um, it, it, but it can be used to help you choose how to step down therapy. And there are cut cutoffs in the guidelines um, for both children and adults. The other thing that came out, and this is one of the strong recommendations, in children ages four and younger who have recurrent episodes of wheezing, pheno does not predict the development of asthma. So uh, before, remember, right at the beginning, we decided giving these kids an ICS and albuterol works. Uh, now what about checking the pheno to de see if they'll develop asthma? And that doesn't seem to be a good idea. Don't do that. And the final topic that was covered was bronchial thermoplasty. And so, you know, the question is, you know, in, in adults, uh, patients with uncontrolled asthma, should I use bronchial thermoplasty? Now, bronchial thermoplasty, right, it's, it's done with a proprietary device that attaches to the bronchoscope. And what happens is it uses thermal energy, okay, to reduce the muscle associated with airway constriction in asthma patients. You're kind of burning the muscle if you will, so to, and you're trying to reduce the airway smooth muscle, essentially. What did the guidelines recommend? Most individuals 18 and older with uncontrolled asthma should not undergo bronchial thermoplasty because the benefits are small, the risks are moderate, and the long-term outcomes are uncertain. It may reduce severe exacerbations with standard care alone, but not the other critical outcomes, and it was only the severe exacerbation. There were only three trials. They were all funded by the bronchial thermoplasty companies, okay? And actually, there was very limited data that this treatment helps in the long term. The benefit actually seems to fall away over three years, where there was no difference found between the groups. And there were significant risks. Atelectasis, there's asthma exacerbations and respiratory infections immediately after the procedure, things like that. However, again, some individuals, and why is it a conditional? Because some individuals with persistent asthma may be willing to accept the risk and therefore might choose this intervention after shared decision making. So it is a possibility. All right. So the, the, the step therapies were, were also updated. Okay. And as you can see here, if there was a change, this little triangle came. Okay. So for the ages zero to four, there was very little changes. The real, the one big change was at the start of a respiratory tract infection add a short course of daily inhaled corticosteroids. So for those intermittent wheezers, right, it's hard to call a kid with, uh, you know, a two and three year old, we used to call them reactive airway disease, that term has fallen out of favor, okay? But for these intermittent wheezers, use an ICS. When we get to the ages five to 11, the biggest changes start here in steps three and four, okay? And that's with the SMART therapy, okay? Uh, step two is still a low dose ICS, and as, as needed albuterol, again, in the younger kids who really, I think, it, you know, that, that's where the parents are really concerned about, of course, uh, can I use intermittent therapy? But really, the biggest changes came here in, with smart therapy. Also, immunotherapy and, uh, and um, um, avoidance of uh, uh, environmental factors, okay? And then in the ad adolescents and adults, you can see, you know, numerous changes throughout the steps. Uh, again, so here we have as needed albuterol and an ICS in step two, which is going to be the majority of your mild persistent asthmatics and the majority of all asthmatic. Then smart therapy in steps three and four as well. And then triple therapy in step five, ICS LABA LAMA uh, is, is added. Also, alternative therapies of an ICS plus LAMA instead of an ICS plus LABA. Okay, and then in adding in, uh, immunotherapy. Now, again, interestingly enough, in step six, we don't have triple therapy. Okay, and that's because there wasn't good data. Do I often use triple therapy in my step six severe patients, which who I'm considering adding biologic on? Yes, but the data isn't necessarily there. And there is a question if it, you're doing anything. I, I will agree with that. 
Um, there are different guidelines. The, doc the whole document, by the way, is 322 pages. Okay, so if you're having trouble sleeping at night, that might be a good uh, way to help you fall asleep. Uh, but there are some quick guides, and if you go on the NHLBA website, they will be there. There's also um, tools to help you make a decisions with your patient. That being said, one of my research interests is in shared decision making, and there's a tremendous need for it, not just here, but in, in other uh, areas. And with that, I think I will end and take any questions with one caveat. We'll finally, we'll get the, uh, the final winner, if you will, on our podium. So third place was Asthma Guide. Uh, that was second place. And the first place of all was Flovent, who uh, took home the, the, the prize, if you will. Um, and I, I won't guess if that was Dr. Portnoy or not. Uh, but with that, yeah, I'm happy to end and uh, take any questions that you might have. Let's see if I can. Uh, thank you, Ellen. <clears throat> that was a great presentation. <clears throat> um, I'm just curious, um, when you prescribed um, the combination medicines um, with a long act or with LABA and a, an inhaled steroid, um, to get them covered by the insurance companies, <clears throat> um, so if someone does have a yellow zone or whatever doesn't run out, are you pr are you prescribing them, um, to trying to get them to dispense to it one time, or are you trying to or are you using two different prescriptions, one for the yellow zone, one for the green zone sort of thing, or have have you found anything that worked? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Dr. Dowling. It, it is. It, it, some of this is playing the shell game, if you will, with the insurance companies, which is frustrating, I think, for all of us. Um, I have, you know, I've written the, if someone needs an inhaler one puff BID, I've written it as two puffs BID, so they get extra doses that they can use. Uh, and, and by the way, very important, which I forgot to mention about that um, use of it. In the studies, they, they limited the number of puffs a day to 12. Okay, and, and I tell my patients, don't take more than 10 puffs of an ICS plus famotidol in day. And by the way, in terms of trade names, there are currently only two, your Simbacort and Dulera, that have famotidol. Those are the only two currently. Others may be on the way, but the, the other, other LABAs like Valantrol and Salmeterol, they, you can't do this type of thing with them. But, uh, yeah, so I've tried sometimes writing uh, dispense three at a time. But of course, then those could run out. So it is a little bit of a problem. We're hopeful that over time, insurances will change their ways in some way. Hey, Ellen, that, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed your presentation. It was probably one of the best uh, NIH guidelines talks I've heard. Um, a couple of things with respect to the smart therapy. Um, most of the time, the patients aren't using it twice a day. If they're only using it once a day for a while, I tell them to refill it every month, even if they haven't used it all the way up, and that way they bank a couple of extras for the times when they might need it more frequently. Um, question for you, did the committee decide or, or think about uh, updating the uh, example of an asthma action plan so that it's consistent with smart therapy? Because the plans that we have right now with yellow zone and all of that really don't work with smart therapy. Yeah, Dr. Portnoy, great point, uh, you know, on how to get it covered. But also, uh, asthma, asthma action plans and the use of asthma action plans was one of the topics that actually was, uh, uh, was, was one of the ones that didn't make the cut, if you will, for the final six. Um, that and peak flow meters, right? There is mixed literature about the use of peak flow meters. Less, more, uh, the asthma action plans is a little bit stronger. But definitely peak flow meters you will hear uh, and you will read, if you will, um, mixed literature about their utility. I Now, this is personal opinion. I do use them, uh, especially if someone is a poor perceiver of asthma. Uh, but but um, in terms of updating the asthma action plans, no, that wasn't necessarily um, thought of, though, and it's become a real problem for me, exactly as you're saying, because currently the asthma action plan has, you know, it's a drop down of albuterol, so I'm always crossing it out with my pencil. Uh, and, and writing it in, but it's a good point um, that that those probably need to be updated too. Any other questions for uh, Dr. Baptist? If not, um, we will uh, let you go. And thank you again for uh, taking the time to do this. We really appreciate it. Um, Jay will have this edited in a couple weeks and on on the Cola Library. So for anybody who could be with us today, we'll be able to take advantage of it. Um, again, thanks, Alan. This was great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good week. Bye-bye.